Good morning and welcome to Grand Rounds. I am as excited for this Grand Rounds as I've ever been and I understand the problem of overselling uh, with expectations, but I actually think this is going to be one of our best. Uh, you're going to see a, uh, the heart and soul uh, of these two extraordinary talented residents uh, that they've put into this. So with that, I'm going to turn the time over. I'm not even supposed to moderate this. I was just so excited I wanted to, to come up and and set the mood. So we're, uh, I'll turn the time over to, to Sarah Vagunta and Rachel Patel, uh, two people who are, are, are making our education much better. And goodness, we have a guest in the room. Would, Allie, would you stand up? This is Dr. Allie Simpson. She is a part of our family, but in, I believe this is your first Grand Rounds you've been with us. Welcome. So, welcome. High expectations. Extraordinarily high. It'll be hard to meet. Uh, with that, turn it over to uh, our residents. <laughs> so we're actually just going to take a few minutes at the beginning because I know we gave you guys uh, an assignment, which is this survey that's at most of your stations. If you wouldn't mind taking a couple minutes, there are some pens floating around. Um, and we especially appreciate if you could just be completely honest with this. This is completely anonymous, um, but we're looking to uh, get some feedback before we uh, get started with the introduction to this talk. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, so you had a specific purpose for learning something new and, and allow you to be self-directed about it as well, and you look for different resources on your own. Um, and that makes it, that makes it enjoyable, because you have a project to apply it to, and you're going to be teaching it as well. So we'll, uh, thanks for sharing that. We'll move on to um, the next topic here, which is theories of teaching. So um, one of my favorite quotes from a, a book I started reading recently, recommended by Dr. Petty, um, is how we teach and study is largely a mix of theory, lore, and intuition. Um, this is from the book Make It Stick by um, a couple of uh, cognitive uh, psychologists uh, who, are, who are learning or working on developing methods of, of teaching adults, which is not something that has been studied extensively, but um, is something that's important for us to know about as, as uh, faculty and residents who will be teaching adults. Um, the, uh, one, of the, one of the comics that they, sh they mention in this book is, is this one here, which I thought was funny. So it says, Mr. Osborne, may I be excused? My brain is full. And I'm sure we've all felt like this at some point, whether we're sitting in uh, a meeting um, at, a at a national or international meeting or even in lecture. We know that lecture um, has a, the lowest level of retention of all, all types of teaching. And so this, this pyramid here uh, exemplifies that, I think. So um, this, this uh, pyramid exemplifies uh, the levels of retention of knowledge for various types of, of learning. Um, lecture has the least retention, reading uh, after that. Oftentimes when we read something, we just become familiar with the words on the page and how they look and not necessarily understand um, the topic mm -hmm. itself. Um, whereas teaching others and practice doing something allows for the best level of retention. We also know that those are more active ways of learning, whereas lecture and reading are more passive ways of, of learning. Um, audio, auditory and visual um, learning is also not as, as effective as kinesthetic learning. Um, so it's important to think about when we're teaching adults, a lot of what we know about teaching adults is based on what we've seen our mentors do. What we've seen our mentors do in medical school, in college, um, what we see our mentors do in, as, uh, when we were in residency. But um, there, there are specific ways that, we've, that, that have been developed that are more effective for teaching adults. So when we think about the terms pedagogy and andragogy, pedagogy is a science or art of teaching in general. And most of what we know about pedagogy is actually comes from teaching children. So pedagogy gives the instructor the main responsibility uh, for making the decisions about learning, learning content, method, and evaluation. So when we're a kid, when we're in you know, middle school, high school, we're given a set schedule. We show up for a class. We show up for history class, science class. We're given a curriculum. We're, said, this is what, we're, we're told this is what you have to read on this day. This is what you'll be tested on. And there's, it's a very rigid and structured because um, kids don't have as much background coming into, thing, coming into the topic that they're learning oftentimes. Whereas for adults, it's different. Um, we'll talk about how ad adults uh, have different types of knowledge coming in, but um, this all ties back to Malcolm Knowles' theory of adult learning. So Malcolm Knowles was actually um, an executive director of the Adult Education Association of the United States in the 1950s. Um, he was a psychologist, philosopher, and he developed his theories of adult learning in the 1970s through uh, 90s. 
So um, as, as some of our volunteers mentioned, adults need to know why they're learning something. So just showing up and not having a reason for why you're there makes it very difficult for us to learn. Um, adults also need to be self-directed. So we need to have some, um, we need to sort of have a responsibility for taking on our own education. And we like to seek out our own ways of learning things to some extent, but um, instructors in this situation act as guides and we're learning something new. Um, adults, um, as, as uh, Dr. Mamelis mentioned, bring work-related experiences. So sometimes that can um, add to learning something new or sometimes it can take away. For residents, um, Rachel and I were talking about how this applies to us, but oftentimes we'll see a patient coming in with a similar, patient, several patients coming in with similar presentations, but they might have different diagnoses. So having an instructor uh, or an educator sort of reconcile those things really helps so we can um, apply those work-related experiences. Um, adults also enter with more of a problem-centered approach, which is why we love case-based learning and problem-based learning. Um, whereas kids, they, we, they learn in a subject-centered approach, right? They take their history class or their math class. Um, and we love to apply things immediately. So solving a, solving a problem um, right away, like following a story, following a case, is, is really um, satisfying and, very, and helps us learn. One of the, my favorite theories here is the last one. Um, adults are responsive to some external motivators, but the most potent motivators are internal pressures. This is something sort of reflect on, on your own. Um, so external motivators, we're motivated by better jobs, promotions, higher salaries, but we're even more motivated by increased job satisfaction, self-esteem, quality of life, peer recognition, and wellness. Does anyone have thoughts or concerns about this so far, things that they wanted to clarify? I think that a lot of the faculty do feel that there is a difference, even though that research was done in the 70s, that there is a difference between the way millennials learn versus the Gen Xers and baby boomers. And so um, I'm sure you guys will let us know about the new didactics. <laughs> Well, that's actually a really good point, and I think that part of the, the change in learning comes not only from the fact that, you know, this learner was born in the 1990s or so, which is becoming more the case, but also that we have different tools that are more available for everyone. You know, online uh, pre-work is now more of a possibility, and so there, there's this whole other way that was totally different than how we used to learn um, back in the age of Socrates, but we'll get to that. That is a really good point. Um, so as we've talked to a lot of you so far, and probably we'll be talking to more of you soon, about the new didactic curriculum that we're implementing um, starting in July of 2020. Um, and um, we wanted to talk about one of the primary concepts quickly about this new concept, and that's the concept of flipped classroom learning. I think many of you are already familiar with this. Flipped classroom learning means that it is a, any form of case-based or interactive teaching that is predated by some pre-work assignments. So in contrast to traditional teaching methods where a student is exposed to a topic for the first time during lecture and then has to synthesize it themselves at home afterwards doing their own reading, doing their own worksheets, um, a flipped classroom learning approaches things a little differently where the learner will be um, complete some pre-work, watching a video, reading a textbook, reading an article, come to class more prepared and participate in more interactive um, activities. Because they've done this pre-work, they're now up at a higher level on that pyramid and can uh, participate in uh, a more um, active or blended learning activities. So we know that this is something that is new for all of us, uh, residents and faculty, and we want to make sure that as we move through this transition that you all feel very supported throughout. Um, and so we wanted to um, be specific about what outcomes we're looking for, provide reasoning for what we're doing, um, what we're envisioning, um, and some examples of how this can play out um, in the day-to-day -day didactic curriculum that will be coming next year. So we wanted to look a little bit into the literature first about what have faculty's perspectives on flipped classroom learning been. And so we turned to a couple articles. Well, the first one was this um, article that was published in the Journal of Education of Perioperative Medicine. So they interviewed uh, anesthesia faculty from across the United States and asked them about their uh, understanding of um, flipped classroom learning. And about 60% of them said they had at least a pretty good or solid understanding of what flipped classroom learning was. Um, and of those, about 60% of them had employed that model in their own teaching. And there was no gender or generational difference in those who felt familiar or had employed it. 
Um, but that actually brings up an interesting question. Why is there still this discrepancy between understanding this model and actually implementing it? So the questionnaire went on to ask, what are your, to you, faculty, are your um, perceived barriers to uh, implementing this uh, flipped classroom model? And so here are some of their answers. The uh, colors here, the dark blue being that the, um, the, is the percentage of people who strongly agreed with it, red that they somewhat agreed, green that they're neutral, purple that they somewhat disagree, et cetera. Um, and so you can see that some of their responses that they agreed with more would be that they're concerned that the learners won't participate or won't prepare for the lecture, um, that uh, it will take too much time to prepare for the first delivery in particular, um, that they might be more comfortable delivering a uh, lecture in the traditional format. But actually a lot of people f disagreed with the fact that they said they, they actually did know where to start in the development of a flipped classroom learning. They disagreed with the fact that they didn't know. Um, and so the conclusion of this study was that a lot, some, several of the barriers, many of the barriers that uh, are perceived in utilizing the flipped classroom model could actually be significantly decreased with training and education. And then what do residents think? So uh, this was a, a review article about 22 studies that were published all in the last five years, in fact most of them within the last three years, that interviewed uh, residents and faculty from 13 medical subspecialties. And overall they found that uh, residents had a consistently more enjoyable um, experience uh, with a flipped classroom learning, and the ones who asked faculty said the faculty had more enjoy, like enjoyed teaching this more as well. So then the third question is, does this work? Um, and this is an evolving process. So there is um, some, a growing body of evidence to suggest that yes, it does. Um, that there was, a, for example, a meta-analysis of 225 um, studies uh, that showed that active learning that was involved in flipped classroom learning um, in science, technology, engineering um, programs was effective or as effective or more effective than um, traditional lecture format and also that it decreased the rate of failure of classes that were taught in a more active learning uh, environment. Now, does this work in GME? This is, this is a question that we need to answer. There's not enough data on this to show. So um, we're going to now get from the theory to something a little much more concrete. And so what does this look like um, on a day-to-day -day basis? And so part of this, the, the first part of the process, of course, is starting off with pre-work. What do residents, learners, do ahead of time to prepare for a didactic morning lecture? Um, and so um, we're going to actually ask you to take out your phone for a second. Um, and let's see if this works. Yes. Okay. So, you can either go to the website, but it's probably easier if you text my um, and then you'll get a little text message. I've tried this. They don't spam you afterwards, so don't worry about that. Um, and then you can say A, B, or C in response. So, the question would be, which of the following homework assignments, um, for example, would you most prefer um, if you are learning something new? Now, uh, some, there's no wrong answer here. Um, there are lots of different um, options for uh, pre-work, and these are all valid options. Um, so journal articles can include review articles, can include um, guidelines for medical management. Um, textbook chapters uh, can include um, something from the BCSC. Ones that we've had that have been really excellent have been those where, for example, Dr. Simpson has attached her own uh, interactive uh, um, like study guide to the glaucoma, to a lot of glaucoma chapters. Um, Dr. Zabriskie has done a great job of like directing our attention to certain uh, tables that he found particularly helpful, so, like, so guided learning within textbook chapter. Um, online modules um, are a possibility for more interactive learning ahead of time. Videos, podcasts, we're really blessed with the Moran Core as an option for, for pre-work assignments. Um, oh, that's actually becoming quite popular. And then quiz or assessment allows for uh, the learners to have a little bit of um, some feedback early on, even before they come to, come to the in-classroom session. There's quite a spread. This is kind of interesting. I like it. Constantly adjusting. Cool. OK. Um, So lots of different options in terms of things that can be assigned as pre-work. 
Um, so of course, even on this, there's been, there have been articles published on how to best assign pre-work and what sort of pre-work do residents prefer versus like faculty prefer and things like that. So this is a great article that we found um, published in the uh, pharmacy literature by uh, Han and colleagues about pre-class learning modules and the best practices for applying mm -hmm. these. So I've summarized um, like these, the best practices into four main categories, but there's a more extensive list in the handout that you have um, that was uh, on your table along with the survey that, that you filled out. Um, so it's important when assigning pre-work to make sure that the, the residents are aware of what they're supposed to be getting from the pre-work. So aligning like pre-class learning modules or materials, um, having learning objectives essentially ahead of time so that the residents know exactly what they should be focusing on um, is really important so that when, the, when time comes for the in-class discussion, everyone is sort of on the same page as, as focused on the right topics. Providing materials in a timely fashion is also important because it, um, a lot of these uh, uh, pre-learning um, Pre-work assignments can take like anywhere between two to four hours to do ahead of time, um, and so if, and there'll be quizzes usually at the beginning of an interac interactive session, and people want to make sure that they really know the material well. Avoiding replicating material from pre-class learning to uh, during in-class learning is also important so that uh, residents feel especially motivated to continue to do the pre-work ahead of time, and you can discuss more um, higher level. Um, knowledge and application of the material rather than just uh, understanding or memorizing material. And then finally, allowing time at the beginning of class for the quiz, questions, and a summary of key concepts is important to, again, build on that to application of the material. And there's more in, in your handout there, too. Um, oh, but it's flipped classroom learning, interactive, active. These are all different terms that we have listed up here that essentially are used interchangeably in the literature and by, by us as well. So um, flipped classroom, interactive, blended, active, are all the same. Um, I, I really like this pyramid. It's a little bit different from the other colorful pyramid we showed you. It's Bloom's taxonomy. Um, and the way I like to think about pre-work is the fact that it usually has to do with um, this level of understanding. So. Uh, when we're doing pre-work, we're building on our level of understanding by recalling facts and basic concepts and being able to explain ideas or concepts. And then when you come to class, we're working on the top part of the pyramid, application, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. So this is a way to help organize how you um, approach pre-work versus in-class materials. And there are many different methods of interactive learning that we're going to review in class, uh, re re not in class, in, <laughs> during grand rounds. <laughs> Um, so team-based learning, case or problem-based, audience response system, which you've already participated in, quizzes, think, pair, share, peer-to-peer -peer teaching, role-playing, and games. And we'll talk about all of these. This will be fun. So just wanted to start off with uh, an example of several of these. So team-based learning um, is uh, a concept which let's try out here. So this is a patient, a 69-year-old uh, woman uh, who's coming to the ED and I a resident is called to see her. Um, this is something that our oculoplastics faculty do really well. Unlike um, for you guys, this is uh, mandatory for the residents, but optional for the faculty. Um, if you wanted to talk to the people next to you, in your row or around you, um, and um, come up with a differential for what could actually present like this. Stretches are acceptable. Um, and so we often use this mnemonic vitamin C, so uh, make sure that there, you are not missing anything in the idea categories. Of, Vascular, infectious, traumatic, autoimmune, metabolic, iatrogenic, neoplastic, and maybe in general. We'll just give you like 60 seconds to do that. No, what you what things do you that's not it. It's just bacterial. That's really, really bad. I mean, it's a really bad version of that. Traumatic is kind of the same as vascular. It's like a direct association of or bilaterally. <laughs> 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 Yeah, 
You're just like participant. How much did it bribe you? All right, we're going to put some people on the spot. So, uh, sorry. Okay. Team, we're going to start off with the resident yeah. team in the second row. Could you guys name some of your differentials, especially for the, like, the first couple of options? Oh, for the first couple, vascular, infectious, traumatic, something like that? So vascular, we said like uh, kind of the same as traumatic. We said like uh, CC fistula. Could be. Or you could have like uh, bilateral retrobulbar hematomas. Um, and then you could have orbital cellulitis for mm -hmm. infectious. Sounds um, good. Um, team in the front row, how about any autoimmune, <laughs> metabolic, hydrogenic? So we thought about thyroid eye disease and then Wagner's um, GPA, granulomatosis with That's a good point, yeah. orbital pseudo pseudo tumor, and then IgG4 disease. Can't um, forget IgG4 disease. <laughs> and then we also thought about, um, I've seen a lot of patients in the ICU that have chemosis, and so maybe if this patient was intubated and their fluid status was, I don't know, really shifted. Bad exposure keratopathy. Sounds good. Fluid everywhere else. Um, anyone else want to volunteer ideas for the, the last couple? I don't think congenital really applies as much, but like neoplastic conditions. We have iatrogenic plastics injections of local anesthetic prior to surgery. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Lymphoma is a good one too. Excellent. So uh, team-based learning is, is really interesting <laughs> because each member of a team feels like they have to be accountable to their team. They are put on the spot, but they can talk to their peers first before they are questioned by the instructor. Um, it allows for peer-to-peer -peer learning, so residents at different levels can all contribute something. They can contribute something that they've seen on call, what they've learned about so far. There can be uh, teaching from uh, higher level residents to lower level residents. Um, and this goes along with the uh, general idea of like a social learning theory, that when we're learning among other people, we're, uh, we are more driven, we are more um, held accountable. It's, it's your buddy. Just another quick example of team-based learning. Um, you can take it to even a, a high level of understanding, even more details, by providing like a full case or a series of pictures. So you could, um, another oculoplastics case here, you have an orbital lesion, you go through um, the uh, photograph, the imaging, and even the pathology, and you ask the team to discuss what is the diagnosis, um, what is your approach to resecting the lesion, what nerves and vasculature muscles should you be aware of, what tools would you want to make sure that you have if you were in the OR, and how would you protect the globe and the optic nerve in this situation. So you can go into as much detail as you'd like and or even have a stepwise approach to team-based learning. You can have multiple choice questions as well and have people um, raise up cards to give your answers and things like that. Fun fact, that's I don't know, sister, carcinoma. I didn't know that until Stroud told me. Rachel. Sorry. <laughs> well, I wasn't sure. I was looking at it. I did. It was my vitamin C. Um, audience responses is something that you guys have already uh, kind of participated in. Um, I'm actually going to see. Don't look. <laughs> the elevating eye intorts while the depressing eye extorts. Here, for example. It's difficult to see the torsional movements So this is eye, a, um, a but the vertical using audience responses is something seen. that Dr. C exemplified for us. She gave us the uh, nystagmus uh, video clips um, and then had us all And in this patient, respond. seen. So um, let's. Uh, and so on the same text message that you probably already have participated in, you can actually vote for this one here. Where does an abnormality be causing this type of nystagmus? Most likely localize. We're going to get you all to learn something today. <laughs> Y'all are smart. <laughs> no votes for the lonely medullas? Uh, no, so C cell and stigma is typically paracellar or midline pituitary chiasmal area. Um, okay. Okay. 
So you've probably heard of the term peer-to-peer -peer teaching. We've talked about it a little bit with uh, team-based learning already, um, but this is another example of peer-to-peer -peer teaching. So um, pretend you're coming into a didactic session about glaucoma. So for the next didactic session, bring a case of a patient you've treated with severe POAG. The PGY2s will teach us the staging system for POAG and how to determine if there is progression of glaucoma. And the PGY3s will teach us the potential surgical options for this patient and the pros and cons of each. So peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, teaching is actually a very effective way to draw on um, levels of understanding of uh, residents at, at uh, PGY2, PGY3, and PGY4 levels and, and sort of build their confidence too and, and accountability for learning things ahead of time. Um, there are uh, styles of teaching that um, I just wanted to shout out to a lot of people here who have been great at exemplifying these examples. Um, in pathology, this is, Dr. Mamlis says, an excellent uh, uh, demonstration of the Socratic method. Um, and that is, I just want you all to appreciate how awesome this is. <laughs> Oh, snouts. It'll go. We'll see. Um, what Dr. Mamelis does is he'll have a whole bunch of slides. Um, the residents will come in lined up. In, oh, it's floating. <laughs> uh, that's fine. Uh, we'll, we'll be uh, lined up in, in the row, and he'll go down the line and ask people questions. What does this look like? Uh, how do you remember this? What mnemonics do you have to remember? There's, there are some very predictable ones that we cannot leave this room without knowing. Um, and this sort of uh, teaching is especially helpful for when we need to see something, recognize it, repetition, uh, multiple years in a row is critical. Um, well, anyway, we have the, our pathology lectures coming up this month, so if you all are interested, Dr. Mamelis is doing an excellent job starting off next week. Um, so think, pair, share is another concept that I came across a, couple, a year ago or so, and this is a great way to modify the Socratic method of just, or like pimp questions sort of, and allow residents or learners time to think about a response before they have to answer right away. So this is an example of when, when we use think, pair, share during our journal clubs. So we did a journal club topic on the phase two trial for the uh, neurotrophic uh, growth factor. Um, and we, we talked about the various stages or various phases of trials by having the uh, residents split up into pairs and then write down phase zero through four, what each, what the definition of each uh, phase, and then um, have time to uh, make sure they understood it. And then we went around uh, each pair, uh, went around the group and asked each pair what the definition of each of them was. So um, it's just, it just uh, gives people time to, again, think about a response before they have to uh, be put on the spot, which can be a helpful way of learning and um, allow for better retention sometimes. Um, there's also the methods of quiz, uh, which most people are already doing an excellent job. Um, Dr. Hartnett and Dr. Chaya are two of uh, our faculty who do this really wonderfully. Um, and this can be starting off with a uh, didactic session with a quiz and um, allowing 10 minutes or so for residents to be, um, to be held accountable for the pre-work that they've been doing. Um, then we'll review the answers. So this is my... Uh, documentation of a quiz I took with Dr. Chaya last year, um, in which we, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of answers. Um, so we would then go over, the, uh, go over the quiz, and we would actually go over this quiz for a significant amount of time, but not just what is the right answer, but also using the quiz as a springboard for learning a concept, so that when, um, even if it's a PGY2 resident who's never seen uh, phacoantigenic glaucoma before, phacoanaphylactic glaucoma before, um, they'll have had this question on it, and they have this in mind when they're learning learning the concept. So um, role playing is always a fun way to, to learn something. Um, this is, uh, it can usually be applied in, in specific situations though. So role playing is very helpful when you're learning a new exam technique or new, new um, interviewing technique, um, such as motivational interviewing, for example. Dr. Crum actually applied this when we, in her uh, functional uh, or inorganic vision loss lecture last year, where she had us um, get out our, our phones, bring out the OKN um, application on the iHandbook, and have us test out how difficult it is is to um, not follow the stripes when you have better than 2400 vision. So we're going to demonstrate this now. So we're going to have two of our residents practice role playing here with the OKM drum. <laughs> 
Um, so there's many other like tests that you can do. It's just a great role playing, like again, a great way to just learn new exam skills. So if there um, is a lecture where we're learning mostly new exam skills, for example, like a PEDS lecture, you could even have that lecture in um, the exam suites. Why even come to the, um, the lecture hall necessarily? Uh, games have been a, a great component of learning recently. Um, Dr. Crumb, for example, performed an excellent example of, the, of um, example of Jeopardy uh, to review neuroophthalmology um, and plastics for OCEPs last year. Um, and Jeopardy is very common. So uh, uh, Eric Hansen and Chris Kamansky also converted an FA conference into uh, Jeopardy style. Um, there was candy involved. Um, Brad ate a lot of it. And um, then we, we had another Jeopardy quiz last night. Um, and then we also have, this was a Who Wants to Be a Millionaire uh, lecture that we had in which we learned about different types of diabetic retinopathy. And we were asked, when we were on the spot, what are these uh, questions? Like, what is the effect of aspirin on diabetic retinopathy? And what's the definition of high-risk PDR? Um, and then you could phone a friend or 50-50, things like that. It was a lot of fun. And then we actually came out with some good uh, learning experience from the end of that. Uh, taboo game was another one that I wanted to try. You know, try to how, to tell your to get your residents to explain a concept if you can't use those words. Um, and then, uh, how do we use this to flip the entire didactic session? Um, and so, one example of this is what Dr. La Rochelle did recently in her infectious posterior uveitis lecture. So, a week ahead of time, she gave us a brief little email saying, "Hey guys, like here is the topics that I want to cover." Um, gave us a list of those, and then some like rare things she wanted to go along. With, she wanted us to learn as well. We had pre-work, which included a core lecture, uh, courtesy of Dr. Vitali, two review articles, and then we had to select two of those rare entities to read a paragraph about. Um, and then when we came to classroom, to the in-class session, we had a quiz, we reviewed the quiz, we had a really case-based discussion to learn some of the concept concepts. Um, then we had, we broke into small groups and residents would teach each other their rare entities so we could all like have some peer-to-peer -peer learning involved there. Um, and then we had an oral board style review um, with like three minute uh, put on the spot, here's how you do oral boards um, and learn the concept at the same time. And overall, I feel this was like one, just one example of how we can integrate a lot of these um, different methods into a single hour worth of learning. So I um, just want to pause real quick and see if the faculty or residents have any thoughts on any of the, these ideas or any concerns. Um, if, you know, Dr. Crum, you want to add anything about how millennials like to learn or any other follow-up questions about that, I'd be happy to discuss it now or later, too. Dr. Jenny? I just have a comment. The, um, uh, I don't feel like I'm that far out of medical school, and yet the curriculum has totally changed from when I was there. And uh, I, I thought it was pretty progressive to just have a Socratic method of teaching, and now there's so much more than that. And, and I kind of struggled with, is this move a transition to adapt teaching to the current learner's preferences, or, or are these just timeless truths about learning? And I think it's actually more the latter. I think forever, active learning has been better than passive learning. And, and I think probably the current generation of learners are just holding us more accountable to teach ways that are effective. Not, not that this is a need to adapt to millennials. I thought that for a while, or that maybe this is just us trying to adapt to changing generations. But I, I think these are all, these have always been more effective ways to teach and to learn, and we're just finally kind of catching on. And I, that's kind of my own sort of evolution as I've been teaching with the medical school and the PA program that they forced me to change all these ways, and I was a little uncomfortable at first, but I, I really think that when you do it after the fact, it's just clear how much better it is for people to learn when they're actively engaged in synthesizing, synthesizing through the lecture. That's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Petty? Just to tell off, like Griffin, I, one thing that's interesting in this tension between, you know, the, the millennials <laughs> and, and, and sort of the way we've always done things is, Within this building, we're extraordinarily lucky, right? This group, by definition, they're high achievers already, right? And they come in, they, they've gone through the gauntlet of getting into medical school, gone through the gauntlet of doing well in medical school, and they've, they've arrived at, you know, again, a, a place where we, you know, Judith can tell you, we just choose the best of the best that we can. And so, within this building, the challenge is not motivating. Right? These are individuals who will always be more motivated to learn intrinsically than I'm ever going to be able to generate extrinsically. 
And so now it's just capturing that <coughs> energy, motivation, intention, and, and making it as, 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 we'll just say, as, as positive and as, as an experience as possible and as effective as possible. And so <coughs> you can see already, I mean, among faculty, we're already doing a lot of extraordinary things. And this is just, again, this ultimately is putting more on, on your shoulders as residents. It's more time for you to have self-directed learning with us as guides. And ultimately, I mean, you know, we've been extraordinarily successful, you know, again, you, if you don't know this, we've got, you know, going on seven years, 100% first time board pass rate. You know, there's nowhere to go but down. That's the thing that you guys have to remember with that. So, so as, you know, as we embark on this, you know, you guys are motivated, and, and this is just coming together of two groups who are, you know, want to be in this growth mindset together. I'll take uh, Lydia first. That's a really good, that's a really good uh, point, and I think that that was, goes back to one of uh, what Strav talked about in terms of good practices for pre-work, that um, being specific about pre-work, of course, is very helpful, so having questions, integrating different types of pre-work, we all had different ideas of what we wanted. Um, there also are different, going to be different flavors of what people are more comfortable with, um, and so I, I don't think that we're going to say that uh, we must do it this way, but to encourage people to use their, uh, what their strengths, their creativity, and um, draw on that for assignment quizzes ahead of time, tables ahead of time, um, case-based studies ahead of time, uh, and then using, uh, and then, you know, having all of those as possibilities of what people could do. As long as they're given out ahead of time and we have time to do them, I think that, that's, that there are a lot of good answers to that. Dr. Sinclair. Sorry, I'm Steve Sinclair. I come from, I don't know, is it Philadelphia or Philadelphia? But what I've observed in my own department back there is that physicians predominantly practice in the way that they learned 15 to 30 years prior. And the question is, how do we teach residents who have come through medical school learning particular things that they have to pass an exam and not question those so that they can upgrade by this interactive learning to upgrade their current practice modes where they have to run in, complete the epic with, that has pre-formatted you know, kind of things that they have to fill out. And how do we develop AI behind this that will assist us in making these updated decisions? This is what we need to integrate with interactive learning. We need to do this. Whether it's with vision measurement, I recently have been trying to with my delving into trying to measure vision measurement, I went and I questioned 100 people that I thought were the authorities, looked at things, and what I found out was that even though they're thinking in, in new modes, they're still practicing the way they did 15 to 30 years ago. So how do we transition physicians so that they can practice with this questioning attitude, so they can update from what they learned from their mentors two, three, five, or 15 years before? That's where we really have to develop our tension. Yeah, um, that's that's really it's definitely exactly we need to apply what we're learning in the long term for our work as well. I want to touch back base with what Dr. Jardine said real quick. Um, one of the things that this make it stick was really helpful for me to realize is that yes, maybe it is true that we the way that we are asking. Um, to be taught now with active learning is how we've always learned as, as adults. Um, one of the things that they debunk in, in this book as in the cognitive sciences, scientists or psychologists debunk is that <coughs> maybe don't really have like auditory visual learners. Maybe we're, we're really just, adults need to just have recurrent quizzing. Like we need to quest, consistently be asked questions over and over and over again so that learning is effortful and what we're learning is ingrained in our mind. So self-quizzing, like when you take notes on the chapter, writing down questions that you want to make sure that you are able to answer for yourself later on, like understanding like your own learning objectives and being able to fill out, fill in the blanks later on, and then coming to class and being able to answer those questions. Going to 
clinic and going to surgery and being able to answer those questions when the attendings ask you or when you're trying to solve the best way to approach a case and things like that. So constant quizzing is seems to be more of an effective way for adults to learn. And it's really um, make sure that we're understanding the material and, again, not just the words on a page or... Um, what we're hearing uh, during lecture. So auditory and visual is just what we're more familiar with um, and th like that kind of method of teaching, but it's really um, sort of debunked at this point, I think. I think that's a, that's a great point that um, as, as adult learners, um, we, we do like to be asked and to, to repeat the, the information that we should have learned back to you. And I find that on rotations, when I've had medical students with me, even if they're really at the base learning of ophthalmology, if I say, hey, read about anterior uveitis when I can soar, and if I gently tense them throughout the day, they, at the end of the week, they thank me for that. They're like, that is the best way to, to engage me throughout the clinic, and they really they value having these feelings that could just repetitively you know, process the questions and the it back. So for attendings on rotation, I know we're busy, um, and we don't want to like intimidate the new residents, but it's actually, um, in, a, in a nice manner, a very helpful way to engage the residents is just to continually ask them questions. Even if you think it's a really basic question, just to throw it out there and then um, you can find little, maybe little areas that need to be um, clarified or, so I, I know I would encourage the faculty to do it, to do it more for residents on a constant basis because that's what active visual learners one idea that we didn't really have time to talk about very much, and I think is in this book as well, is the idea of, of spaced learning as well. Um, and my, oh, sorry. The idea, one idea that we haven't really talked about is that of spaced learning. So you, you learn something initially, and then you have a, a, a trigger to um, learn it again or remember it again or ask to repeat it again like three days later. <laughs> and then that is um, gets deeper into our uh, circuits of memory there. Um, and so having both in classroom as well as learning um, in the clinic, learning in surgery, is really helpful to have those different opportunities for space learning there. <coughs> yeah, I just wanted to highlight, like, I think this whole thing with asking questions, and I think we can maybe all agree as a resident group, like, Kamansky's effort of, like, doing these jeopardies with us, I think is just, like, an amazing way. Like, it's a really non... Um, volatile environment just with like us residents with a bunch of food like at, after hours and like him just up there like showing it. it's just like such an awesome way I think we all walk away from this like hour just with so much knowledge because like you said we like he shows us these pictures we answer the question and then we share our mnemonics we just did this last night for like two hours like and it was awesome I think it was like the equivalent to like probably like four hours of studying within that two hours just because we all shared our mnemonics, our kind of like weird, inappropriate ones that <laughs> help us like remember these things. So just like this this question-based learning, like La Rochelle was saying and what you guys said, I think is like so, so important. I don't think really any of us mind necessarily being quote-unquote pipped. I think it's really helpful. Love it. Yeah. yeah. We're very lucky to be at this institution where the culture has been moving towards this anyway. I know that we're asking you guys um, to help uh, us implement it, but we, are, we really appreciate um, everything that everyone has been doing so far. Um, on that note, just wanted to say really briefly what's next. This is the last slide. Um, that is, this quiz, uh, sorry, this survey was, <laughs> surprise, um, was, is part of this next step. Um, that is, we would like to know how this actually uh, can roll out in a graduate medical education environment, in ophthalmology in particular. There isn't that much data on there. And so we don't want to inundate you guys with surveys, but we really appreciate um, your honest feedback on this, and we look forward to working with you um, in the future. You are, of course, I'm going to volunteer myself and probably Strav as well. If any of you have any questions in the future, want to catch us afterwards, talk about this more. Obviously, we're nerds about this, and so please let us know. Um, and a big thank you to the um, mall uh, attendings and, and residents and also Dr. Stagg for, for feedback on our, our presentation. Thank you.